Well, whoa, whoa. sorry, hot mic. Warning. Um, so I'm going to read Psalm 130 for us as we kind of enter into some worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. <clears throat> Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for the Lord is unfailing, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. So if you uh, would stand in us, or stand with us, we're going to sing, uh, Be Thou My Vision. I know it is well okay I know that song um, we are gonna try to do women say it is well and then the men echo it as well okay
guys can be seated. Lord, we thank you. Whoa. Lord, we thank you for just an opportunity to, as part of worship, return a portion of what you've allowed us to have, and we thank you for that. We pray that it would be used not only wisely, but to further your gospel through this community and our, our eastern shore and throughout the world, and we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. And at this time, I'd like to invite the kiddos to head on back for the special kids lesson that we have prepared. And thank you to the volunteers and all the work you do in making that happen for them. While they're transitioning back there, since there is a question, the, the, the baby materials out in the entryway are part of a, a spring missions project that the Bridge Network is doing. Uh, they try to do a, a missions project like that every season, like they've done uh, backpacks for victims of human trafficking. And uh, we're just trying to collect what we can for the pregnancy center here on the shore as part of the whole bridge network to be able to uh, support uh, the new life and um, the parents who are in need there. So if you have items that you'd like to bring, you can check out the bulletin for that. Well, this morning as we're um, picking back up our life together in these uh, church gatherings, uh, we're also picking back up our journey through the book of Judges in the Bible. Uh, we've had a break uh, for the Easter season and for uh, there being a giant hole in the ground outside, but uh, now we are back in the book, and I am really excited about it. Uh, I love this book. The same way that you can love a movie that isn't necessarily happy, but it's still really good. Um, the last time we met, we celebrated the resurrection of the Lord Christ at Easter, but your walk with the king who conquered death, who really rescues you, who, who leads your life, will be helped by the record that we read today in Judges. So what will it show us about ourselves? What will it show us about the Lord that can guide us in how to seek him this morning? I'll, we're going to open it up and open up uh, one of the last leader's stories in Judges. But first, let's just open ourselves up to the one who made us. Let's pray. Father, we're here to hear from you. We're here to be guided by you. We want to keep that joy of Easter going forward, even in a, even in a, a, a train wreck of a book like Judges. But Lord, we know all of your word is needed and can guide us in our walk with Christ and we pray that you'd show us that in our lives and speak into them by the power of your Holy Spirit through your word today. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Lord, we open ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so two people approach God in prayer with the exact same words. They say, God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I'll give you whatever from my life that you want. Please help me. Two people pray these exact same words, and God is pleased 
with the one prayer but rejects the other one? How is that possible? Well, please turn with me to the 10th chapter of the book of Judges. Judges chapter 10. This is on page 218 of the Pew Bibles if you want to read along in one of those. Page 218, Judges chapter 10, verse 6. Judges 10, verse 6. It says that the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshipped the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Aram, Sidon, and Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites and the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord. They didn't worship him. And so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. He handed them over, sold them to the, the Philistines and the Ammonites, and they shattered and crushed the Israelites that year. And for 18 years, they did the same to all the Israelites who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. And Israel was greatly oppressed. So they cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you. We have abandoned our God and worshipped the Baals. But the Lord said to the Israelites, When the Egyptians, Amorites, Ammonites, Philistines, Sidonians, Amalekites, and Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, Did I not deliver you from them? But you've abandoned me and worshipped other gods. So I will not deliver you again. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them deliver you whenever you are oppressed. But the Israelites said, we have sinned. Deal with us as you see fit. Only rescue us today. So they got rid of the foreign gods among them and they worshiped the Lord. And the Lord became weary of Israel's misery. Now, this is different. This is different. So far in Judges, we we haven't seen this kind of pushback from the Lord in the face of the people's sufferings and pleas. It almost shocks us as readers thinking, hold on a second, this this isn't the way the formula works, right? God is supposed to say, yeah, sure, I'll save you. But instead, it's like he's saying, no, I'm I'm, I'm tired of this. (laughs) You've already decided you don't want me a million times. Go ask the other fakes that you've chosen instead to save you. Whoa. The, the, the people say, okay, okay, yes. We've sinned, and you can do whatever you want with us. Just rescue us today, please. But this is actually the last time that we hear the Lord say anything for the rest of this story. And this first scene, setting the stage, ends saying that God finally grew tired of Israel's misery. Now, what does that mean, though? What does that mean? Is God done? Like, he's had it. (laughs) Like, he is past the limit of his abused mercy. Or does it mean that his compassion just could not stand seeing the suffering anymore? Despite their betrayals, he was, he, just, he was going to save them now. Which is it? Well, we don't know yet. We, we don't know. We're going to have to watch to find out what happens. Let's keep reading in chapter 11. The camera pans to a new player, a guy named Jephthah. It says, Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior but he was the son of a prostitute, and Gilead was his father. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when they grew up, they drove Jephthah out, and they said to him, you'll have no inheritance in our father's family because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tov. Then some worthless men joined Jephthah and went on raids with him. Sometime later, the Ammonites fought against Israel, and when the Ammonites had made war with Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tov. And they said to him, Come, be our commander, and let's fight the Ammonites. Jephthah replied to the elders of Gilead, Didn't you hate me and drive me out of my father's family? 
Why have you come to me now when you're in trouble? And they answered Jephthah, That's true. But now we turn to you. Come with us. Fight the Ammonites. And, and, and you will become leader of all the inhabitants of, inhabitants of Gilead. And so Jephthah said to them, If you're bringing me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me, I'll be your leader. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is our witness if we don't do as you say. And so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead. The people made him their leader and their commander. And Jephthah repeated all his terms in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah. Now, <laughs> Jephthah's backstory aside for this second, you know, the fact that the Israelites ran to this guy aside for a second, do you notice anything interesting here? Do you notice any similarities in the way that the people treated Jephthah to the way that they treated the Lord? Think about that for a second. What a strange parallel with how infinitely different the maker of the universe is from this leader of organized crime, Jephthah. And yet, for both of them, the people reject and dismiss them until they need them for help. Didn't I already rescue you a million times and you still worshiped the pagan statues instead God pushed back? Wasn't I already a part of your family, a part of your people, and then you hated me and drove me out of your family? Jephthah pushed back. Sure, yeah, okay, the people press on. But whatever, we'll sweeten the pot for you, all right? You can do whatever you want with us. Just rescue us now. You can be our leader if you just win the war and free us. Now, God's not playing that game. Nuh uh. He's not RSVP and yes or no. That's not how this works. God does not, you don't bargain with him. But Jephthah's like, all right, I want it in writing. Still, the parallels here paint a sad picture of the average person's spiritual sincerity. I mean, forget the fact that the people turn as quickly to a criminal as they did to God just to get what they want. Uh, you know, still haven't gotten a reply from our creator. It says he's read the message, but I don't know, guys. Like, you know, let, let's ask that violent man that we kicked out. I mean, he seems to be pretty good at killing people. Uh, let's get him to come here. I mean, forget that for a second. We're starting to catch on. Oh, man. It may have seemed at first like these desperate people were really trying to give their lives to God. And God was so callous and said, no thanks, you deal with it, it's your mess. But in all reality, God saw through the plea bargains just like Jephthah did. God knew that this was not a change of heart, it was just a change of plans. The whole, God, we turn to you now, was just a new attempt at getting what they wanted. Only, hey, why don't don't we use the Lord this time, right? Why don't we use Jephthah? Uh, We don't seem to have other options. He seems to be the most promising right now. All right, let's see how things play out with Jephthah. This guy, for everybody. It's it's not really what you think at first. We, We don't jump right into battle with the bandit king. It, it, we actually jump into more attempted negotiations. All right, pick it up in verse 12 of chapter 11. It says that Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites, the bad guy, asking, what do you have against me that you have come to fight me and my land? Okay. The king of the Ammonites said to Jephthah's messengers, hey, when Israel came from Egypt, they seized my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and the Jordan. Now restore it peacefully. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of Ammonites to tell him, hey, this is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came from Egypt, Israel traveled through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let us travel through your land, but the king of Edom would not listen. They also sent messengers to the king of Moab, but he refused, and so Israel stayed in Kadesh. All right, let me pause here and just sum some things up for you guys. We get ten more verses of Jephthah giving the enemy king a history lesson. 
Jephthah challenges the Ammonite king's revisionist fake news here that says that Israel stole their land in the past. No, it's not what happened. Israel respectfully asked to be able to travel through those territories back in the day. Israel had no interest in taking over that land. They just wanted to pass through it. And the Ammonites have no historical claim to the land that they're talking about. Jephthah gets all that right. Jephthah even makes this about God and not just historical territories in a good way. God protected the Israelites when their enemies unfairly backlashed. And man, he'll do the same thing to you today if you backlash to king of the Ammonites. But (laughs) there are some details in Jephthah's dispute that are not quite right. Jephthah says in verse 24 that the Moabite God is the one who gave the Ammonites their land. But Deuteronomy 2.19 specifically says the Lord God gave the Ammonites their land. Jephthah gets a little sassier the longer his speech goes on and all fired up. He says, hey, in verse 25, are you better than Balak, king of Moab? Did that king ever fight against Israel? Well, not for land disputes, no, but yeah, Balak, king of Moab, did fight with Israel in in Numbers 22 to 24. It just kind of makes you wonder, is Jephthah the most up-to-date and interested in the works of God out of everybody? From a spiritual perspective, this is a brilliant thing to slow down on at this point in the narrative because it shows us that what's at war here, what's causing an impasse, is not just a military campaign. It's two competing viewpoints. It's two altered memories, two versions of what matters most. Just, hey, they took it, I want it, I need it, this is mine, give me yours. Or, this is what God has done, this is what he's doing, and this is how he's brought us to this point. How sad, though, that the champion of the word of God in this climate is Jephthah. A man whose self-confidence And self-deception put him much closer to all the people he hated than he realized. So this part ends in verse 28. The king of the Ammonites wouldn't listen. And so now we expect to jump right into the battlefield, right? But even still, before the swords are drawn from their sheaths, there's another negotiation. There's a vow this time, a bargain Not too different from the ones that the Israelites made earlier in the narrative. Look at verse 29. The Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah, who traveled through Gilead and Manasseh, and then through Mizpah of Gilead. He crossed over to the Ammonites from Mizpah of Gilead. Jephthah made this vow to the Lord. If you, in fact, hand over the Ammonites to me, Whatever, whoever, anything comes out of my door of my house to greet me when I return safely from the Ammonites, that will belong to the Lord. I will offer that thing as a burnt offering to you. Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord handed them over to him. He defeated 20 of their cities with a great slaughter from Erer all the way to the entrance of Minith and to abel Kiramim. So the Ammonites were subdued before the Israelites. When Jephthah went to his home in Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was his only child. He had no other son or daughter besides her. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and he said, No, not my daughter. You have devastated me. You have brought great misery on me. I have given my word to the Lord and I cannot take it back. And then she said to him, Father, You have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, for the Lord has brought vengeance on your enemies, the Ammonites. She also said to her father, Let me do this one thing. Let me wander two months through the mountains with my friends and mourn my virginity. She's still so young. Go, he said, and he sent her away two months. So she left with her friends and mourned her virginity as she wandered through the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, and he 
Well, he kept the vow that he had made about her. She had never been intimate with a man, and now it had become a custom in Israel that four days each year, the young women of Israel would commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. This is, um, this is like, this is hard to give words to. It's horrendous. Jephthah wins the fight against the Canaanites, but commits to acting as brutally and as wickedly as they do just to make sure that he does. He murders his own teenage daughter. I mean, there's, there's no way of dancing around that. But before we talk about what this means for Jephthah and the Israelites and the Lord and the story playing out here, let me just, um, let me just settle some critiques about the Bible that come out of this. Sometimes people get rightly disgusted reading this, um, but they target that disgust at the Bible itself because they think that God legitimately required Jephthah to do this because of his vow. It's like his daughter herself ends up saying, you know, you, you, you've given your word to the Lord. You, you have to do what you've said. The Lord is the one who gave you victory. And it's true. Jephthah struck a deal, and God gave Jephthah victory over his oppressors. But have we seen God make deals at all so far or refuse them? Have we seen Jephthah prove himself as a reliable interpreter of the word of God or as someone who patches on pieces of it to serve his own egotistical agenda. I don't think Jephthah really knew or remembered Deuteronomy 12.31, which condemned the detestable practices of the Canaanites for sacrificing their own children and solemnly told the Israelites never to do the same abhorrent things. I don't think that Jephthah really knew or remembered Leviticus chapter 5, verse 4, which says, and I quote, If someone swears rashly to do what is good or evil concerning anything that a person may speak rashly in an oath, without being aware of it, but later recognizes it, he incurs guilt in such an instance, okay? If someone incurs guilt in one of these cases, he is to confess that he has committed that sin. He must bring his penalty for guilt for the sin that he's committed to the Lord, a female lamb or a goat from the flock, as an offering. And in this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf for his sin. Do you see what that's saying? If you make a rash vow for something evil, you pay the fine as part of taking it seriously and humbling yourself. You make atonement for that sin and get right with God again, but you do not add to the guilt that you've committed by committing the evil vow. That's what the Bible itself teaches. So I don't want to step too far outside of the shoes of the story itself, but at least for the sake of of those who take issue with the Bible, maybe people you know who bring up this kind of stuff, it's worth clearing up how clear this is, that this was Jephthah's atrocity, not God's. You all with me on that? Okay. This is one of the final life stories in a book about a downward spiral of defying God. You see what I'm saying? Jephthah's execution of the vow, just like the vow itself, is pious only in his own reckless and self-serving mind. All right. Being a dead horse here, you get it. Jephthah will brazenly use or give or take anything that he can to come out on top over the Ammonites, over his backstabbing family, over his judgmental and unconvinced future subjects. And if the loss of one innocent life is not enough to question the worth of his contribution, the story ends in chapter 12 with yet another dispute. Not with enemy kings this time, but with fellow Israelites. It says the men of Ephraim were called together and crossed the Jordan to Zaphon. Different tribe, different group within Israel. 
They said to Jephthah, Why have you crossed over to fight against the Ammonites, but you didn't call us to go with you? We will burn your house down with you in it. Then Jephthah said to them, My people and I had a bitter conflict with the Ammonites, so I did call for you, but you didn't deliver me from their power. When I saw that you weren't going to deliver me, I took my life in my own hands, and I crossed over to the Ammonites, and the Lord handed them over to me. Why then have you come today to fight against me? And Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead. They fought and defeated Ephraim because Ephraim had said, You Gileadites are Ephraimite fugitives in the territories that are ours. The Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan, leading to Ephraim. And whenever a fugitive from Ephraim said, Let me cross over, the Gileadites asked him, Are you an Ephraimite? And if he answered, No, they told him, All right, then say, Shibboleth. And if he said, Sibboleth, because he could not pronounce it correctly, they seized him and they executed him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 from Ephraim died. 42,000. Jephthah judged Israel six years, and when he died, he was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. The end. When the hot-headed Ephraimites approach Gideon in Judges chapter 8 and angrily argue, hey, why didn't you let us join the battle? Gideon talks them down. When they approach Jephthah and get angry, 42,000 people get slaughtered. Makes you wonder how the death count of the Israelites compares to the 20 city of the Ammonites that were subdued for Israel's sake. The Ephraimites' violent threat was not so different, was it, from Jephthah's own desperate vow, we'll burn whatever is in your house. How ironic how much they all had in common. And then Jephthah leads and dies in six years. Probably wasn't that young. Probably from bloodshed. So, Here we are. Did the Lord leave them to their devices? Or did he compassionately deliver them? I guess both, right? Very clearly it says, the Lord handed over the Ammonites to Jephthah, just like the Lord conquered the Sidonianites and the Moabites in in Moses' days. Guys, praise God. God, like we've seen repeatedly in Judges, each worst step things take, each time we think, all right, this is just way too far gone. It it is not enough to stop God from moving history, moving Israel towards that promised descendant of Israel who would redeem and forgive us like we celebrated on Easter. Praise God that he is so far more determined to save us than we are to even care about it or care about him. Praise God, like Romans 5.10 says, that while we were yet God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through Jesus. Amen. God does rescue in his compassion and his mercy. But as far as consequences go in that downward spiral, The Israelites did, in fact, reap the leader that they sowed. Not a true servant of the Lord, but a negotiator. Now, before I get to the huge relevance for that and how it encourages our walk with Christ, I want you to imagine there's like a clone of myself stepping onto the stage, pressing pause on regular me, and the main sermon... And just here to give a little quick, short side sermon from Jephthah, specifically for the men in the house. Jephthah is the poster child for toxic masculinity. He is violently powerful. He is brazenly self-destructive. And the louder that he exerts himself, the more destruction he causes to all of the people around him. But the question is, what that means for men? Does that mean that we emasculate ourselves? Are we going to sacrifice 
what it means to be a man of God on the altar that Jephthah dies on. Because it was not just bad masculinity that ruined his life. It was the lack of good masculinity. Jephthah grew up fatherless, brotherless, surrounded by only worthless men. And look at the havoc it caused. The answer is not making male power itself something offensive or male leadership something toxic in itself. It's having the guts to stand up and reclaim the responsibility of it that God intended. Power used to protect, leadership used to serve, not to get ahead, planting your stake in the ground and using your words to fight what's wrong, not just what's annoying or inconvenient. You want to be a hero, a warrior. Well, for one thing, it doesn't work when you're only serving yourself and you don't know Christ as a king or an example. But here's another thing. How ironic is it that this hulk of a bandit king with all his violence is constantly unable to overcome by brute force what his words trap or free him into? Words, promises, reminders, lies, commitments, arguments, verbal battlefields dominate this entire narrative from the agreement with the Gileadites at the start, the history debate with the king of Ammon, the vow about his daughter, the yearly commemoration of that daughter, the argument with the Ephraimites, even the whole Shibboleth dialect test. It's what's spoken that saves or kills. If you want to know what it looks like to be strong but gentle, bold but kind, guys, it has far less to do with how many house projects you get done and how high up in your company you rank than it does with the words that you choose and how you use them every single day. To give grace and life or anger and apathy. Doesn't the life of Jesus show the far greater power of his words than his force, even when he had every force of nature at his bidding? But if you want to do that well, then Jephthah also shows us that throwing around a couple of sermon points you heard once or a couple of verses is not enough to equip you with an accurate confidence in the wisdom of God. So immerse yourself in the word of God and everyone you influence will be served by that. Don't be ashamed of manhood. Be a man. Just don't be the man that Jephthah was. The the man his ego led him to be. Be the man that Jesus leads. All right. Clone Andrew steps off stage. Mini sermon officially over. Unpauses the original pastor and the main sermon continues for everybody. The story of Jephthah is a tree that grows out of the seeds of the very first scene. Both the broken leader and the bratty masses have this in common. They came to God with a changed plan, not a changed heart. They came to God with a changed plan, not a changed heart. They negotiate what should be a surrender. They treat their maker like a business partner at best without ever changing who's in charge or the direction of the spotlight. What this shows us about ourselves, about the Lord that can help us to seek him, how to walk with the king who conquered death, is that God isn't trying to pull off your independent plans. He's trying to change your goals. If you approach him like a last resort, a backup to bargain with, he will not entertain that because you don't make deals with God. You surrender. He's not looking for people to use him. He's looking for people to know him to worship him above everything else. So to try to use my words here to, 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 to build up and to, to, you know, let this be an encouraging avenue of growth for you. Think of it this way. Just find where you are negotiating with God and surrender. Find where you are negotiating with God and surrender. God, if you... Heal me of this sickness, then I'll be more devout. God, if I can just, you know, still justify these sins that I really like, I'll be more willing to let you decide on everything else about my life. Well, at least like the religious stuff about my life, maybe. God, if you 
make me win this fight, then I'll give you whatever you want. God, if you make the place where I live a freer and safer home, then I'll appreciate you far more for who you are, and I'll be less faithless. But negotiating isn't always easy to spot just based on the words of the prayer alone. Right? Please help us, God, the Israelites say in Judges 10. That could have been something sincere, but it wasn't. Because what was driving that prayer was not wanting to surrender to God, but to use him. God isn't interested in that. He's not interested in negotiations. He's interested in changing hearts, changing goals, changing lives, and seeing surrender. So seek the Lord, find where you're negotiating, and surrender. What are you still looking for God to provide you beyond what he's provided here and in the gospel? How would you fill in the blank? I'll be content in my relationship with God when blank. Is that coming from a sincere surrender or an untrusting bargain? Think about that this week. Do you come to Christ when you have a change of plans or with a change of heart? Find where you're negotiating and surrender. Let's do that now. Let's pray. Father, we surrender to you. We thank you for this part of your word that teaches us about that, that helps us to see our blind spots, that provide such a marvelous contrast to the way that Christ leads and guides us. Lord, thank you for his life and forgiveness. I pray that you'd help us to identify the places where we're just trying to negotiate with you and convict us by your Holy Spirit to surrender and find freedom and joy in that. It's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, this morning, before we close, we have a a tangible opportunity to choose to surrender where we've been negotiating, and that's with communion, because communion is a chance to remember everything that Christ gave to save us, that everything that is worth surrendering to him. Communion shows us the surrender that Jesus had to his Father. It shows us what it looks like to surrender to God now, not just Hey, okay, you have it. But letting Christ reign and give us forgiveness. Communion approaches the God of the universe a very different way than the Israelites did or Jephthah did. We're not here to make deals. We're not here to present our cosmic business partner with a change of plans. We're here with a change of heart. We're here to give up the throne. We're here to take to heart the rescue that God has brought to align our thoughts, our leadership, our morals, our values, loves, purpose, in light of that. That's what communion helps us with. As we eat the bread, we pray and think about the body of Jesus, which was broken to make us whole. As we drink the cup, we pray and think about the blood of Jesus, which was poured out as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus received the penalty that we deserve so that we could be forgiven. He rose from the dead to give us life. I'd like to invite the deacons at this time to come up and to prepare passing out the elements. We take communion together because Jesus has brought us together. He's broken down those divides, that hostility between each other. So guys, you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion with us. The only thing that we ask is just what the Bible asks, that you be a follower of Christ. Uh, If that's not you, you are always welcome here. We just ask that you pray during this time instead. Uh, Use this as an opportunity to surrender yourself personally. The deacons um, are going to be passing out the bread first, so I ask that as it's being passed, you pray and you ask God, where am I negotiating? How can I surrender? And then I'll lead us in taking the bread together.
Luke chapter 22 says that on the night when he betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. do the same with the cup as it's passed. Continue to reflect and surrender to the Lord, and then we'll take it together as I lead. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this tangible picture and practice of surrender. Seeing Christ as our model who never negotiated with you, always surrendered, and for our sake too, Lord, we thank you ultimately for the opportunity we have to surrender and find life in Christ thanks to what he's done. And Lord, I pray for those who haven't done that, that they would know that and that it would change their lives. I pray for those that have, that you would still help us by your guidance to see where we're still holding on to negotiations. Help us to surrender more sincerely to you and find life and joy in that. Lord, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As the musicians lead us in one more song of responding to the Lord, as always, I just want to invite you or anyone here, uh, if you want help in giving up the negotiation and, and surrendering, the deacons and I will be up front by the altar to pray with you if you'd like prayer. Um, we'll be there to pray with you. But I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing about uh, the promises of God.
God, how faithful you are, how good you are to us in the face of our fickleness, in the face of our strife with you, our negotiations with you. Lord, we praise you that you are so kind and compassionate that while we were yet your enemies, you sent Christ to deliver us from the consequences of our sins, from the evil that works against us. Father, we didn't deserve that. None of us ever have deserved that. And we just say you are so faithful and kind, and uh, we surrender to you. We pray that the world would see that in us and join in as well. Please, Lord, equip us with your word, with the light of Christ, so that the whole world outside of here can see and be changed by it. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We're going to take about five minutes and uh, transition into the meeting today, but uh, we don't mean to rush you out. Uh, Go in peace and reflect on the goodness of God and his faith.